Welcome to season two of Limited Supply, the place for refreshingly real takes on what D2C is really like. We're your hosts, Nick and Moyes. Let's get into it and start making money. We're back for episode 11, I believe. Or sorry, no, episode 10. Yeah, this is episode 10, um, season two. Season two, episode 10. We're getting close to the end. We've started lining up some uh, pretty big guests, actually, for for next season. I think we're going to do some more guest stuff. And um, we've got a whole list of things to talk about. So what are we starting with? Okay. We got a bunch of stuff to talk about today. Uh, First thing we're going to talk about is open AI. Um, We're going to talk a little bit about diligence in the wake of what happened with Theranos and SBF. Uh, We got a bunch of, we got a lightning round of news that came out uh, with with e-commerce. And then I'd love to talk a little bit about M&A and some other bigger things that are happening in the e-commerce community. Um, And then uh, some tactics that you presented to clients, Nick. Um, some like, you know, real street tactics about how to improve businesses. Well, let's start with OpenAI. Uh, have you look, looked at OpenAI at all? Have you like played around with it? So what's crazy is, I, so I've used OpenAI for, yeah, probably a few months. Like as soon as um, they started uh, letting people come into the beta, yeah. uh, I think I was one of the first people on, uh, I could be also completely wrong. Basically it was like months ago. And, um, I remember thinking like, all right, this is pretty cool. And, you know, I thought it was like, uh, I, I didn't realize like who was behind it. I thought it was just like another startup. So I'm thinking like, okay, this is a, you know, this is a cool product. I wonder what they're going to use it for. Maybe it'll be for like writers. Cause you know, you could, you could sure. type, write me an intro to this and it just writes it. Yeah. It's the end and, of the New York times. Like, you know, uh, Oh, for sure. The end. Um, but But then what was cool was when I realized that the people behind it are like the guy who started Y Combinator and, um, and a few others. And, you know, this is basically just an API. That's all it is. And it's just going to be like this base layer of something that there's going to be an entire ecosystem built on top of. And that's kind of what got me excited about it because now you, you know, this is like open AI will be used in e-commerce companies. It'll be used in car dealerships. It'll be used by like, you know, people who run factories, like literally everybody in the world is going to use this. And there's going to be this entire ecosystem of like industries building a version of themselves on top of this product. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the guy who started is Sam Altman. He was the president of Y Combinator. The guy who started Y Combinator is another guy named Paul Graham. But um, it's the most incredible like software I've ever seen. Uh, honestly, like I, I, I still don't even understand how it works. Like, you, you can type in, uh, like, you know, write me an, uh, let, write me an abandoned cart email. And it's like, here's this amazing abandoned cart email. And you're like, this is 90% as good as I could have done. Like, it, yeah. it's not 100% there because it doesn't mention my product and the product attributes, but it's 90% right. of the way there. Write me a blog article so that I can create an email and send traffic to it. Um, uh, you know, write me an article about why native deodorant is a great smelling deodorant. And they're like, here you go. Here's an article about it. And it's like a pretty yeah. good article. And I, I just can't believe, I, I, if you still ask me, how is this done? I'm like, there's some, the first time I brought, my brother actually introduced me to it. And he's like, watch me write this post. And it comes out with an article. And I was like, wow, this must be an article that was saved on the site earlier. And some guy just copied and pasted it on the back end really fast. And yeah. then like, he just wrote like 10 more things and 10 more articles appeared. And I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. It honestly looks like magic. I've never seen anything clo- closer to magic than this. It's incredible. Yeah, um, it's pretty insane. On the uh, on the All In podcast, they talked about this concept of models as a service coming into this world of open AI, where different models can be built on top, like I was mentioning earlier. And uh, there's going to be like marketplaces to buy and sell models. Well, the open AI stuff I thought was amazing. And I was like, uh, this is great. And, and the places that I thought it was really useful for e-commerce is like abandoned card emails, um, reactivation emails. Ad copy. Like, yeah, ad copy, um, you know, copy all over your landing page even, uh, you know, yeah. FAQs, return policies, um, you know, uh, like a native, we'd write blog articles where we'd be like, let us tell you about why we released this scent or a summer scent or something like that. This thing right. automates it. Again, it's not a hundred percent of the way there, but it is 90% of the way there. And you know, everything else until now has been 5% of the way there. So it's, it's yeah. orders of magnitude better. Uh, I thought Especially it was for, 
Yeah, especially for like founders who uh, or or people who are running like lean operations, getting getting something that's like eighty percent baked, ninety percent baked, and you just have to tweak it or add that little sparkle on it, it'll save you hours. Yeah, it's really incredible stuff. Um, I can't wait to see people start using it. And the best part is, you will never know when people start using it because it's not right. like uh, you know, it's so it's so natural. Um, but I do think that like. Um, you know, uh, I, I do think that it's really incredible. Someone said, like, write me, uh, write me, like, I saw on Twitter, some guy wrote on the, uh, the open AI, they're like, write me an, uh, an email to an investor that's cocky about, uh, you know, how he has to invest right now. And they're like, the round is going to be heavily oversubscribed, but we will save room <laughs> for you. You have till this weekend to decide whether you are in or not. You know, if you, if you're lucky enough to get in, you're going to be on this special list and you're going to be so lucky and all of your LPs are going to be lucky. And I was like, this is the gr- like you can even just be like be cocky and it's like okay it's got yeah. an era of or or of swag to it now. I don't know totally. how they can do this. I still have no idea how they can do this. They are like you know the guys who created this uh, until now I've literally thought AI is complete bullshit except for the Facebook ad algorithm. No one right. else has done a good job of determining like you know there's all these e-commerce uh plugins that are like we're going to use AI to help you increase AOV. We're going to know what this guy wants to order and how he should increase his uh, basket size. So when it says you purchase this, you should also purchase these three things. We're going to use yeah. AI to determine that. And I'm like, this is all horse shit. This, the Facebook ad algorithm was genuine AI to understand what ads to serve to people. And that's been the only yeah. AI until now that's been meaningful until open AI. And I'm just astounded at how good. Yeah, for basically up until now, AI just means there's um, like a bunch of people in India doing it. Yeah, that's and right. you just have no idea. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, let's shift gears. Uh, I- I'm really curious to see what happened in the next year about o- OpenAI, but let's shift gears and talk about Theranos for a hot second. You yeah. Know, Sunny Balwani. Did you read the book Bad Blood? Uh, I did not. So Sonny Belwani was like the, you know, COO and boyfriend of uh, Elizabeth Holmes. And he was this like, she was such a little like, I, I, you know, some people admire him for this and some people hate him for this. But what he would do is he would look at like, you know, your badge when you're leaving a building, you have to badge yeah. out to go outside and then badge back in to go inside. And he'd be like, why were you at lunch for an hour and 15 minutes? I looked at your badge. It was, you were gone for an hour, 15 minutes. What were you doing? You went to the bathroom for 20 minutes. What were you doing for 20 minutes in the bathroom? What? Everyone else takes two minutes to go to the bathroom. Takes you 20 minutes? What the fuck were you doing? You didn't badge in on Sunday. What? Why didn't you badge in on Sunday? Why didn't you come? He was like, you know, that level of on top of shit and his employees. He was like monitoring their badge activity to see how long did they go to the bathroom? How many breaks were they taking? How long was their lunch? Uh, you know, did they come in on weekends? He got sentenced to more time in prison than Elizabeth Holmes. I don't know if that's right or wrong. Um, wow. But that just came out. Um, I, I haven't followed the SBF thing. Have you been following it? Uh, decently closely, like not not reading much on it other than yeah. what's on Twitter, which okay. I feel like has been kind of the, the place where it's all happening. Um, yeah. Do you know what happened with that? With the yeah, he like thing? let the hedge fund Alameda uh, and the girl who was running it, his girlfriend, borrow money from depositor accounts at um, FTX. And, you know, that hedge fund went bankrupt. There was a run on the bank. He was out of money. Uh, that's yeah. all I know. I, I don't like, I still don't know if there were crimes committed. Uh, I, yeah. I, I well, don't know even, enough information. Even crazier was that um, the, like the bank account that you originally deposited into was Alameda. So, so he was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't bar, let them borrow the money. We they just like never, money. we just never fixed it. Yeah. And, um, Anyways, it's kind of crazy. It's also sad for all the people that lost money. But Super sad yeah, that guys. that was another use case that I mean, not a use case, but another example where uh, you know, so many VCs just like threw the money in and um, did no diligence. And uh, and actually now there, I mean, there's so many companies doing layoffs as a result of over hiring or like looking for the wrong vision. Or um, there's another company that I I never invested in, but um, had thought about it at one point and. You know, it was like built in a VC shop, um, and it was like the entire. It was like the VC's idea <laughs> that they built, and today they were like, "Yeah, we're sun." You know, we're like sun we're closing the company down. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me ask you a quick random question: what can, What type of diligence do you do on businesses? And I, I'm going to answer that question myself. Uh, let me answer that question first. Mine is sure. virtually none. Um, I'll look at the deck. 
but I'm not like going through and sort of saying, okay, um, let me verify that your revenue is real. Like, I, l- show yeah. me your Stripe deposits into your bank account. Show me your customer list. Um, I'm not l- at that level of diligence, particularly if it's a smaller check. If it's a twenty-five to two hundred fifty thousand dollar check, and uh, actually five hundred thousand dollar check, I'm doing a very light level of diligence. Particularly if I'm investing alongside a bigger VC fund, because I'm like mm-hmm. sort of piggybacking on the idea that they're doing diligence. What kind of diligence are you doing? Um, well, one that you should also say that you do is uh, you you a lot of times will like jump into their Facebook account. Yes. Right. Yes. So that's that's like, yeah. I mean, I think personally, like regardless of um, who you are, like you're investing because you see a reason to invest. And like, if you go through with the investment and that's usually based off like what you tend to be good at from a skills standpoint. So like if you understand Facebook ads better than most people, then like that's kind of all you need to verify it. Um, I I would say, um, yeah, not, not like a ton of diligence um, generally. So if it's like a software company, then, you know, I'll talk about it with people who run brands and, and see if it's like something that is of, you know, that they would subscribe to. But then one thing I learned on top of that was like, uh, even if somebody says, you know, they want to use, um, let's say like some, some like NFT creation app with Shopify, right? Um, if it is not solving a top five problem in somebody's head, uh, then your market either be like your market becomes people where the founder is not super influential on the marketing department, which is like pretty big. Yeah. So, um, if it's not, if you're not solving a top five founder problem, I think that's like the biggest question I ask for software companies. And, um, and then other than that, yeah, like how many, how many brands would onboard it right away? And I've found that the, the, the poor decisions I've made is generally because, um, uh, I didn't ask that question of like, you know, does this solve a top five problem? Even if I got super excited by the idea personally. Um, also things I've found that don't work are like things you can't, like when somebody pitches you a concept and it's not easy to understand for like a five-year-old, it's generally not going to work out, um, <laughs> yeah, which is yeah. another interesting learning. But, um, but I guess my question is a little bit different, which yours is sort of like, you're, I think you're answering the question of like, how do I determine whether I want to make an investment or not? You know, yeah. if like Theranos was like, look, we're going to make, we're going to do a hundred blood tests out of a single drop of blood. Like remember the image where she was holding a drop yeah, of blood yeah, like yeah. this or something? And you're like, okay, this, the, if this technology exists, it's amazing. Uh, SBF was sort of like, hey, look, we've got a really good hedge fund that right. has separate bank accounts than, uh, you know, uh, FTX. Um, and, and like, you know, both of them are super uh, profitable. If those are true, if that's true, it's a good investment, right? Like if, um, what's a good example? If I was like, hey, look, Nick, I've got flying cars. Uh, you can now move from, you know, you're in New York now. Imagine getting to, uh, going from Manhattan to Queens in three minutes. You'd be like, yeah, that is a top five problem. Let me invest. But totally. you know, do you generally look at the underlying technology? Do you look at like, like I never look at, re- like I look at revenue. I see you tell me you're doing $4 million in revenue a year. But I don't actually go out and verify that you're doing $4 million in revenue a year. Do you right. go out and ver- do you do that next level? No. Like, Let me verify that. Yeah. And no, I think that's not really. Yeah. That's what like happened with Elizabeth Holmes. You know, that's easy for us to do because we're writing small checks. Obviously, Elizabeth Holmes and SBF raised hundreds of millions of dollars. And so the P, you know, if I was investing a hundred million dollars, I'd probably start engaging to it. I'd probably get onto another level of diligence. Um, but I'll give you the, the reason I bring this up is because I found this rampant in the e commerce community as well. Mm-hmm. I was I, inv- I was going to invest five hundred thousand dollars in this company uh, alongside a top tier VC fund, um, like you know, a, a, a simply a tier A VC fund in an e commerce business. And uh, they said, like you know, the e commerce the uh, VC fund sent me the deck, and they're like, "Hey, boys, we want you to invest alongside of us." And so I looked at the deck, and I was like, "This deck contradicts itself." Uh, at one point, the deck said that they had like one hundred thousand customers. And another point in the deck, it said that they had like 250,000 customers. And so before I was like, am I an idiot? Like the, the VC fund has already made the decision to invest. This was the deck. You know, how am I not seeing what they saw? Like, I don't know what I, I like. I'm I, like, I'm not be able to read the deck like they were able to read it. 
So I called yeah. up the fund. I called up the uh, partner at the fund and I was like, look, I don't understand this deck. They say they have 250,000 customers or 100,000 customers. And it was a subscription business. So it was a material difference. It wasn't like past customers. It was like active subscribers, basically. Yeah. And I was like, uh, which one is right? Uh, like, you know, how, how, like, how is this? How did you guys get comfortable with this? This doesn't make any sense to me. And they were like, I remember the partner was like, Oh, we did a bunch of diligence. I'm positive we looked at this. Uh, so we're going to be, we're going to tell you the answer and we're going to be able to give you the right answer because we know what's right. And I was like, okay, great. Uh, you know, your, your associate did a bunch of diligence. You forecasted what is right. And so, uh, they're like a day later, they're like, actually, we're not sure. We didn't catch this. And I was like, well, you're investing tens of millions of dollars. You should have caught this. And so then I contacted the, uh, the company itself and I was like, Hey, you have a hundred thousand people and 250,000 people in this deck. Which one is right? And they're like, Oh, we were forecasting we would get to 250 and raise money a year from now. But in reality, we decided to move this up. So it's not 250. It's a hundred thousand people. And I was like, this is fucking insane. Like, uh, yeah. you, this is a deck that people are relying on. You wrote 250,000 in one place, a hundred thousand in another place, a VC fund that ended up investing tens of millions of dollars in this business. Uh, you know, made an investment decision without catching this mistake. And then that business ultimately went under. Uh, and everybody lost their money, including me. And so, um, I'm still shocked at how little diligence VC funds do. And I'm shocked at how little diligence I do before. Like, you know, if you told me, if Nick, you were buying a house, you would do a ton yeah. of diligence to make sure that the roof was good and that there wasn't any leaks and there wasn't any mold. But in, yeah, totally. in the VC world, people write $500,000 checks. Without even like, you know, they're like, oh, it's on fire. Oh, no, there's a fire. There's a lot of heat coming from this side of the house. I'm not going to turn my head to see if there's a fire. Over here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's actually, it, it's been super shocking. Like I've, I've seen um, other funds who will just like, they, they get excited by a deck and, you know, within a week they've wired a million dollars, like no real diligence at all. What would be some things like, how would you verify revenue or subscribers to like, they're, like, would it be developing some sort of a platform, like a, a Taito, where you just like plug everything in? That's actually one thing I do when I was looking to buy a company. That was one thing that we did is we just went to everybody. And instead of like them sending, you know, going back and forth about like, is this a fit? It was just like, all right, we like this business. Uh, we think we're in similar ranges of the price. Why don't you plug into Taito and we'll just verify everything. And uh, we found, I mean, almost every company I plugged into, it was like, Oh, these, these numbers are completely wrong. Then we're like, what you're saying, you know, your costs are way out of whack. But, uh, but yeah, how would you do that as a universal thing? Like in the, maybe it's an opportunity for software. I think that, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that it's an opportunity for software. And you did more than 90% of people do, which is plug into Taito so I can verify your numbers. Um, right. let me give you two examples. One is when my dad was originally buying a gas station. Everyone would like sort of bullshit him on the numbers of uh, their dollars of sales. They're like, we're selling a hundred thousand gallons yeah. of gasoline a month, and we're selling sixty thousand dollars of sales in like you know convenience store, like cigarettes and beer and candy a month. And so yeah. my dad would always be like, "Okay, we're close to a price. I'm gonna sit in your store for two weeks behind. Like I'm just gonna sit there. I won't touch anything, and I'm just gonna make sure that you're doing you know for two weeks you should and you're doing sixty thousand dollars a month. I'm there for half the month. You should do around thirty thousand dollars in the two weeks that I'm there of grocery sales, and you should do yeah. about fifty thousand gallons." And they'd always give him some excuse. No, no, we, we're not comfortable with you sitting behind the cash register for two weeks. <laughs> no, no. And he's like, yeah, that's right. This is bullshit. I'm out of here. And yeah. so, um, you know, that's the, that's the diligence that he would do. Uh, you know, my brother bought a business about a year and a half ago. And, you know, what he did is he's like, send me every one of your bank statements over the last two years so I can verify deposits from like Stripe to make sure that this is good. Let me take a look at your um, Shopify account and let me make sure, let me take a look at your Clavio account. You can just do a screen share. Let me see how many email addresses there are. Let me take a quick look at the email addresses to make sure they're not all nicksharma at gmail.com, nicksharma1 at gmail.com, nicksharma2 at gmail.com until 100,000. And that's how you get to 100,000 of these things. Um, so there are like some spot checks that you can do. There's another thing called quality of earnings. Like if you're buying a business, there's something called quality of earnings to make sure that like, you know, the numbers that they've provided are of good quality. Uh, but I think with VC funds, like, you know, we, we talked a few weeks ago about Mark Andreessen investing $400 million into Twitter. And he's just like texted Elon Musk and he's like, I'm in for 400 million, no diligence required. You know, that's bananas. Um, and I've done like, you know, the same thing on a one, one millionth of that scale. And th that's also stupid of me. 
If I was going to give someone right. $50,000, I would like look, I would get their FICO score. I'm investing in some random founder without looking at anything because he sent me a deck and I'm like, these numbers look good. And I've never right. done more diligence than that. And now I'm like ashamed of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've realized like a lot of the impulse, uh, impulse, like, yeah, I'm in is also generally a bad decision because you just go off a of hype. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And like that, that adrenaline that's uh, pumping through you. Right. Um, okay. I want to, uh, let's shift gears really quickly. I want to ch- chat about a few other things. Um, one is post Black Friday. Uh, you know, U- UPS MI has been a disaster. I think we've seen that. I saw a Twitter thread on it. A bunch of the businesses that I'm an investor in have seen it. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen it as well, Nick. A couple other things that I want to chat about. One is China lockdowns. Did you see China is like easing their lockdowns now, Nick? They're no longer doing like a zero COVID policy in China. Yeah. That's I'm, great. I'm curious to see what the like ripple effects will be for like, um, e com- like for operate, like, you know, China is the uh, operational engine behind a lot of e-commerce businesses, whether you yep. make components there or boxes there or something there or your entire product there. I'm curious to see how that, like, will that change? Will costs go down because more people are able to work? Or was, is, is it sort of been like, you know, zero COVID policy has already been bullshit in the last few months and costs don't change much? Yeah. Um, I have no idea. I'm curious to see though. I hope that, um, costs go down. Yeah. Likewise. Um, the other thing I saw recently was Stripe basically saying that when they, when you an issue, when you issue a refund, what a long time ago, if you issued a refund via Stripe, Stripe would be like, we charged you these fees on this order. You know, you bought a stick of native deodorant for $12. The customer returned it. You returned the $12. Stripe mm-hmm. had charged you 50 cents for that. Now they're going to give you the 50 cents back because the customer got a refund. More and more Stripe is like, actually, we're just keeping that 50 cents as well. <laughs> uh, and PayPal has been keeping that 50 cents for a long time. Um, wow. And, uh, you know, Stripe sent out an email. It's always a little confusing because they're like, we are keeping the interrange interchange discovery rate V2 and we will refund you, you know, V3.3. And I'm like, I don't know what any of these fees are. Like I'm not, uh, you know, I spent all day, uh, inside the, uh, my stripe, my credit card processor account. But, yeah. uh, the short, short end of the stick was, or the, the uh, you know, uh, we got the short end of the stick, which is they are now going to keep more of the refund than they were passing along to you. Damn. Um, okay, let's skip the uh, other fast news. Let's go to the Hilma acquisition. Have you heard of Hilma? Yeah, yeah. Hilma. This is the yeah. So this is the vitamin company. I yeah. think they have uh, the best bloating product. Actually, um, you've used I've been it. a huge yeah. I've been actually a huge fan of this brand since the very beginning. And uh, I remember talking to them right when they had started. They were uh, trying to do e-commerce. I don't think it was working too well. Then they were like, okay, let's try. Um, Let's try working in retail, and they just crushed it. Yeah, they did. You know, um, I don't like this. Uh, the only news I have is from this article that I linked to in our shared doc, Nick, uh, about the acquisition in modern. Uh, it, it was in modern retail. Um, you know, they said they grew sales 100% in 2022. They said only 25% of their sales were from retailers, which I don't think is right. It's, I always thought it was a lot more. Uh, but they, I, I, you know, this article says 25% was from retailers like Target. Um, and then it said that they had raised $7 million, but they never, they never wrote the price of the business. They were never like it traded for X dollars. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I know that they raised a solid amount of money, I think, too. 7 million, it says. This article says. Yeah. Oh, okay. Have you, have you heard of another brand called Love Wellness? Yeah. Uh, Lauren Bosworth's company or Low Bosworth. Uh, that's right. Yeah. They're also in the same sphere of like, you know, um, multivitamins. They've got a bloat vitamin as well. I don't know what, I, when did this take off? When did this become such a huge, like, like multivitamins somehow, somehow, you know, despite 50 years of multivitamins and innovation every six months, still new brands <laughs> conquer the multivitamin space. Goldie, yeah. Ali, Love Wellness, Hilma. How many, how many multivitamins can be, uh, can there be? Yeah. Well, okay. So Love Wellness started like seven or eight years ago. And I'm not sure when it started to really take off. I know now they're like a mid eight figure business and they're in Target and Ulta. Um, and they do a ton of e-commerce, a ton of subscription. Um, but I, I think it's so like, you know, Goalie is another example of like a vitamin company that's absolutely blown up. And, um, 
there's a few others like, you know, liquid IV is a good example of that as well. Uh, I feel like basically, you know, the vitamins are, I mean, like everybody knows the formula of these vitamins. They're all out there and they're not like prescriptions. So there's nothing super proprietary in there, but I think it's a combination of like just adding that extra 20%. Like for example, the ritual multivitamin, you know, anytime you open, uh, and Hilma does this too, but anytime you open a vitamin bottle, it smells like shit. Like you want to throw up. It's so bad. But with Hilma and Ritual, you can smell it and it's like, oh, this smells like Christmas, you know, or this smells like winter. And um, so there's just like things that these brands do that just make it a better experience. And then like Ritual, for example, added this entire layer of convenience with the e-commerce portion, better storytelling. And if you look at like all the other vitamin companies, you know, probably like 95% of them, they look shady, they're sketchy. You know, if you go to Amazon and search like um, uh, bloat vitamin or like vitamin C, you're going to find some of the sketchiest things. You don't really know where it's coming from. Yeah. And, and a few people along the way, like the rituals and the love wellness and, uh, you know, Hilma, they were like, all right, we, there's like a clear target. There's like a clear target of these types of customers that we think we can attract. Uh, you know, like all these other companies, like you might have the, like, there's a a supplement brand called caged, which makes a really good pre-workout. And they, they also sell like other products, but I'm only going to get the pre-workout from them. And, you know, if they sell vitamin D or whatever, uh, I probably wouldn't get it from them because, you know, I'm more of like a, like a Hilma customer maybe. So I feel like it's a combination of like the extra oomph on the, on like the original formulation plus the marketing angle, which is basically, I think it's like 90% of it in supplements. Okay. So you would... So you're sort of like, uh, I trust Cage for pre-workout, but not my multivitamin. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, for ritual, no reason. Uh, what's that, I just what's feel that? for, yeah. So, so for like no specific reason, I haven't yeah. even like researched into it, but I just trust Ritual more, you know, because like their marketing <laughs> matches up with me. They got me. Yeah. 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 Uh, ritual does this great thing. Like um, I've been following them for some time and originally their product smelled like fish oil when you opened it up and it was really gross. Yeah. And they they found this guy, this manufacturer, um, basically a multivitamin manufacturer realized that like there was a huge problem with the scent of, uh, of multivitamins. So he created these small tabs that have like the smell of like eucalyptus or lavender. And they, yeah. it almost looks like a pill, although it's not edible, but it's not one of those like gross packs that's full of powder. And so right. Ritual drops this little tab in. And so when you open it up, it smells oh, like Oh, that's what it is. That's why it yeah. smells so good. It's not like the actual product itself smells that good. They add yeah. a scent to it to make it smell really good. Yeah, it's just um, that little innovation. Yeah, it just seems, um, you know, shocking to me where I'm like every every time I think multi... Like, you know, Ali, I thought was genuine innovation. Uh, I was like, okay, we're coming out with gummies that instead of, say, vitamin D or vitamin C are geared towards uh, problems. You have a problem sure. with sleep, great. You have a problem with digestion, great. You have a problem with hair, skin, and nails, great. Then, I, like, I was like, okay, that seems like real innovation. Uh, goal, you know, let's talk about goalie. Like, let me start by saying I'm an investor in goalie, and I'm an investor in Liquid IV. Liquid IV, like, I thought Brandon was amazing, and that's why I wrote that check. Um, goalie was, you know, killing it and cr- you know, crushing the numbers, and that's why I wrote that check. And like, there was genuine innovation there, like apple cider vinegar. They're like, we are going to be the first to make an apple cider vinegar gummy that tastes good. And that is like uh, made of pectin and not gelatin. And I thought that was real innovation and people cared because it's a vegan gummy. Uh, but like the rituals and Hilma's and um, love wellnesses of the world, I may not be the target market, but I'm constantly like, wow, people can innovate in this market from a brand perspective, from a scent perspective, like you were talking about and win. You know, I think in like a Tim Ferriss's four hour work week, he's like, I have a supplement brand. Like since yeah. the dawn of the internet, people have been like, we're going to make money in supplements and that is still not going away. And that blows my mind. Yeah. Supplements and personal care. So much margin in there. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, personal. Yeah. I guess personal care is the same. Who am I care? For some reason, I'm like, personal care makes a ton of sense. Supplements make no sense, <laughs> but I'm just drinking my own Kool-Aid. Okay. Yeah. Let's shift gears to tactics you presented to clients. And then let's talk about e-commerce because I'd love to uh, wrap up with them. But you, you were telling me before we launched that you just pitched this to clients, to a client. Uh, tell me this, some of the tactics you pitched. Yeah. So this is for uh, an apparel brand. Um, and uh, we had a meeting about, you know, like 2023 planning and whatnot. So anyways, I just thought, you know, we put together this quick list of things to test because 
even though I feel like we've talked about some of these things a few times, uh, 99% of brands don't do uh, most of this. So uh, I figured it would just be helpful to go through them. So the first one was basically like DPA ads. You know, DPAs do super well. Um, DPA, doing, explain to people what DPA ads are. Yeah, so DPA ads are basically... Uh, it stands for dynamic product ads. So, you know, if you have a store, let's say you sell, um, you know, uh, like t-shirts and whatnot, you can upload all, you know, 2000 t-shirts at once. And Facebook will then decide based on what Facebook knows about who it's serving the ad to and the interactions that it's seen on your site. It'll try to match like Moyes with the most optimal t-shirt that he'd be interested in buying. And so, so there's a couple nuances there. One is you get to tap into this different engine than the normal ads engine of Facebook, which I don't actually know that it's a different engine, but I, I'm speculating it is because the performance is usually completely different than normal ads. Um, like they're not always the same uh, CPAs. The um, the other nuance is, um, you know, it can be a very cumbersome thing for large brands to consistently update their catalog. Yeah. So there's actually some businesses that exist uh, like services businesses where you pay them a monthly retainer and they basically, you know, keep your catalog updated. Um, I also think that's actually an opportunity for like somebody to make uh, easy 10 grand a month, you know, a thousand bucks a, a store doing a million dollars a month and you go get 10 stores and you just help them keep their catalogs updated. But um, anyways, with, with catalogs, the thing, the downside is, um, you know, like when you set it up, it basically just pulls the product image from your PDP, which is essentially like, you know, let's say a deodorant stick on a white background. It's nothing too fancy. And a lot of times too, if your PDPs are set up differently than the very standard way that, you know, Shopify might set it up, um, it might pull the wrong title or the wrong like description whatnot. And so, so anyways, so one thing that, um, that I think, or the one thing that we recommended was uh, this thing called Enriched Catalogs. So there's this company called Marpipe, and um, and I'm not an investor or anything, but they what you can do is you upload your catalog. And so let's say you have like all these t-shirts, right? So just t-shirts on white backgrounds or like transparent backgrounds. You upload your catalog, and within Marpipe, it's kind of like Canva. You can basically drag and drop things around. So you can say top left, you know. Uh, uh, product subtitle, like put it here. So instead of, uh, so, you know, your, your product subtitle might be like, um, uh, you know, American flag or, uh, whatever it is that's like on the t-shirt. And then in the bottom right, you can have, you know, a small thing where the price goes. And then on the bottom left, you can say like, you know, if the cost of this shirt is over $35, then display this afterpay logo or this affirm logo. And then in the top right, you can say, you, you know, you can put like a little sale badge and it's a, and make a rule where it's like, if this product is also on sale, then display the sale badge. So basically like you use this editor and you upload a plain feed and then, you know, you can basically spit out to Facebook a catalog that looks super nice. Um, every creative for each um, product is fully optimized for performance marketing versus uh-huh. just like being a plain photo of the product. And, um, and, and like CTRs go way up, you yeah. know, you can generally increase, uh, conversion by more. And anyway, so that was one of the things that we pitched was like, stop sending these, uh, you know, kind of more plain, um, product photos or even like a product with like a light background. Like let's push, um, some, some more, um, you know, th- things with more content on it that still plays in the DPA world. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's great. I didn't realize that you could enrich product catalogs by saying, okay, over $35 shown after payment. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, the second one was sponsored editorial content. So basically, you know, either working with publishers or, uh, blog sites, putting up content there, telling different stories, and then running those stories to different audiences. Because one, you know, a mom is going to want to buy this product for one reason, and she's going to want to buy a certain type of product. And, you know, the, the Gen Z person's going to want to buy it for a different reason. And, you know, a dude who lives in Miami is going to want to buy it for a different reason. Sure. And so you just create co- content, run it to for different each- audiences yep. versus like always running evergreen ads. Yeah. Whitelisting um, influencers is next. Yeah. Whitelisting influencers, super straightforward. Just 
you know, create content with them, run it. What is a um, Sparky? What is that other part of the, on this on the sheet that you got here? What oh, sparking that? TikTok creators. So, yeah. so basically leveraging like TikTok Spark ads. So, um, you know, essentially somebody posts a TikTok, and the way you whitelist in TikTok is if I post a TikTok and you're running the ads, I would give you an ad authorization code, which is like yeah. a long string of numbers and letters. You put that into your ad campaign, and it just instantly populates the creative. And then the cool thing, I mean, for creators, the cool thing is like at any time I can just shut it off as an ad or I can say, you know, no more access or whatever. So uh, that's what it is. But in in this case, actually, this brand has a bunch of um, customers who will do hauls with their clothes. Do you know what a haul is, Moise? Uh, Yeah, I do. (laughs) Like a try-on haul? Yeah. (laughs) So like they'll do a a try-on haul. And I was just saying, like, but, but there's explain already... explain it to everyone anyway. Uh, explain it to everyone anyway. Yeah. Okay. So a try-on haul is like a TikTok trend. Uh, you know, a girl or guy goes shopping, gets a bunch of stuff. And then the TikTok video is like, we're going to do a try-on haul of this brand. And you just wear all the outfits. Yeah. Um, so anyways, this brand has a bunch of customers who've already done this. And I was like, why don't we just go to these customers and be like, yo, you want a thousand bucks? We're just going to turn your thing into an ad. And um, so that was the other idea next to whitelisting influencers from the beginning. Um, So the next one is Polygon audiences. So there's uh, that truck side company we always talk about, Agile. They have this new platform called Polygon. And, um, you know, I can literally be like, all right, I want a custom audience of everybody's, everybody who's visited all the national target stores twice, at least two times per month put that into an audience and send it to me and let me put it in Facebook and then build a lookalike off of that. And um, so that's a cool one for, for like in-store targeting or if you're pushing product in store. Have you used Um, uh, that? Oh, have you used that guy's agile's uh, ads at all before? Have you used his like, uh, you know, data? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. Um, The other one is credit card offers. So this is one that actually nobody really talks about. I mean, I feel like people don't talk about affiliate too much, but the next two are affiliates. So this one's credit card offers. There's two companies that do this. And I forget the name of the second one you might remember, but uh, one is called Cardlytics. And I think this is the one that links with Chase Bank. Uh, But you can basically just put like, you know, hey, your Sapphire, Reserve, whatever your best card is, Get, you know, give them like 20% off and all your other credit card people can go in and add an offer to their card to get 10% off. Oh, and um, okay. yeah, and then there's a second company that does it for American Express. I just forget the name of it. But okay. yeah, whenever um, I see it yeah. on American Express, like I log into my American Express, they're like, add a $10 off uh, code for Bespoke Post. And I'm like, how is Bespoke right. Post working with American Express? Like this seems awesome. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's through these affiliate platforms. The thing you have to watch out for is um, you know you're basically paying for the discount and you're paying the affiliate fee, and I don't think it's uh you know depending on like you're, you're fighting against like some of the biggest direct response advertisers in the yeah. world, so you're you have to give up a good amount. Yeah. And then the last one is um, there's this network called Reward Style. Uh, have you heard of these guys? Yeah, we use them in native. So it was uh it's a two two part platform which i thought was genius this like woman who is a blogger her name's amber she started this company years ago i think maybe when she was in college and she would blog and then um you know she was like i'm posting outfits on instagram and it's not easy to shop them so she created an app called like to know it where um either it would go to like a web page or it was a mobile app And, you know, she could post a picture with her outfit and then immediately, you know, she could say this top is from Nordstrom and this bot, these pants are from Aritzia. And then she could get, she could link them right there. And then she gets the commission because it goes to her link. Yeah. And so, um, so she basically built up this like, uh, massive database of like fashion creators. I think it's mostly fashion or lifestyle. And then the other side is, uh, the advertiser side where, um, you know, they bring advertisers in and they have like a very, like you have to apply to be an advertiser with them. And, you know, some of their advertisers are like uh, Kate Spade or an Everlane or things like that. Yeah. Um, like big, big brands. And um, anyways, it is, it is like the, probably the one affiliate network you can always rely on to like move revenue for you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Like I thought reward style was legit. Like, you know, Everyone else, like I use ShareSale as well. And ShareSale was like, 
guess what? Uh, some guy named Muhammad from Pakistan would like to become an affiliate for Nadev. And you know what he's going to do? He has his own blog. He's not. Uh, he promises that he will never post a coupon code and run Google yeah, Ads. Yeah, or run Google Ads. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> until you give him access. And the first thing he does is run Google Ads and steals your market share from there. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Like reward style was legit and share sale. Everyone who applied through share sale was complete bullshit. Another affiliate scammer is Honey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you could, like we paid Honey half a percent of revenue for every sale where like someone tried to apply a Honey code. It blocked yeah. Honey from it, like Honey was like, we will not apply any codes as long as you give us maybe it was one percent of revenue from those transactions. Like they're you could just buy them all. They're owned by PayPal, and like yeah. everything that PayPal does, it's pure evil. <laughs> I would imagine the Crazy. PayPal CEO dresses up as Darth Vader every day, except for Halloween, where he dresses up as like you know Luke Skywalker. He's like, look, today I tell you it's a joke, but he should have a Darth Vader. Like, you know, the Darth Vader music should uh, play as soon as he walks into PayPal headquarters because it is an evil organization. Yeah, they uh, they just unblocked the long weekend PayPal account yesterday. Okay, so you got to be careful like about eight what you months. Say. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I I love PayPal. You love PayPal. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay, let's shift gears and talk about WeCommerce. You know WeCommerce, yes. like you know the guys who run it. Um, it's Andrew Wilkinson, right? He started it. Yeah, that's it. right. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was looking into it recently, uh, cause my brother and I were talking about it. And let me first by start, say, by start, start by saying, I know Andrew, but I have no publicly, I, I don't have any pub, non public information. All the information I have is e commerce is a publicly traded company. So they have to release all of their earnings every quarter, like every publicly traded company. They're traded in Canada. So the numbers that I got were Canadian dollars and not US dollars. But otherwise, um, you know, I think that like all this information is public. And I pulled this when I was looking into them. And I just wanted to discuss it with you because I thought it was really interesting. Um, yeah. So WeCommerce uh, has three segments. They own some like Shopify apps, uh, like Stamped. Do you know Stamped? Yeah. And a few others, they own um, some themes for Shopify where they basically buy and sell, like they bought themes in the past and sell them. And then they yeah. have a dev agency as well. So those are the three business segments that they've got. Shopify apps, Shopify themes, and a Shopify agency, basically. What's crazy is how much, you know, I'm like, we've sort of gone over how valuations when it comes to e-commerce have been hurt, generally for brands, right? Like Allbirds is down, Growth Collaborative is down. Warby Parker is not doing well, like, you know, from a public, yeah. at least from a stock market price valuation. The businesses could be different, but at least from a public uh, market valuation. And generally, we thought SaaS has been a little bit more immune to this. Uh, e commerce is like, you know, it's focused on e commerce SaaS and they've been hurt really badly as well. Um, so the business was worth about $700 million earlier this year. And now it's worth about $81 million. So the market cap of the business was wow. 700 million and now it's 81 million down, you know, 80 some percent over the past 12 months. Uh, what's really interesting is they bought stamped about uh, like earlier this year, I'm pretty sure in 2022, I think, or maybe 2021, they bought them. Uh, and they bought them for uh, up to $130 million and uh, up to they had uh, up to $120 million sales price or something to that effect. There was a bit of an earnout, But at close, the stamped.com uh, guys got $75 million in cash and $10 million in e-commerce stock. So that's wow. $75 million Good in for cash. Them. Yeah, exactly. It's basically the entire value of e-commerce at this point. Like they right. paid $75 million in cash. And I think it was US dollars. I'm not positive. But um, you know, the entire business is worth $81 million at this point. They should just go back and buy WeCommerce. Yeah, yeah. That's not a crazy idea. Um, <laughs> and in fact, the reason that my brother and I got into this is because he was proposing those things. He always proposes big ideas and then makes me do the work for the big ideas, um, which yeah. is just like my father used to do. So uh, this is how I got into looking at this, these numbers. So in 2021, WeCommerce did $38 million in revenue. Okay. Um, so let's say four, let's call it $40 million in revenue in 2021. Yeah. And by the end of September 2022, they'd done $35 million in revenue. So almost as much as they did the entire previous year. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the apps, the apps business had done $23 million. So let's say the apps business will probably do about $30 million this year, uh, in total, which is, you know, a lot of money. Like the Shopify apps doing $30 million in revenue. You know, I used to think that shop, that SaaS businesses traded for 
10x revenue or 20x if they were growing really quickly. You know, this business has, let's say, a $30 million ARR on apps, and it's trading for $81 million, which means it's not even 3x apps revenue, like, you know, their ARR for, um, you know, apps that they've got, Shopify apps that they've got. Yeah, that's strange. Yeah, it seems really low. Um, Stamped did $5.5 million in revenue in Q3 2022, which I think is a lot of money. Like, you know, that implies that every year it's doing $20 million. Yeah. More than $20 million. So uh, I d- dug into a little bit more about this. So in 2021, the company spent $17 million on headcount, which was about half their revenue. So they wow. did $35 million, $38 million and spent $17 million in on headcount, like just employees and stock options. Yeah. And the other real, real reason the valuation is so low is they have $57 million in debt and up to $20 million in earnouts to some of their sellers. Got it. Okay, well, that that makes sense to balance it out. Yeah, but uh, even like then... If you balance the debt with the, the valuation yeah. or the revenue. Yeah, even then, like if you added the debt, so let's say, let's say you wanted to buy this business and it didn't have any debt on it. You'd have to give them $81 million plus you'd have to give the lenders $57 million. You know, you're still at less than 100. And let's say you paid out all the earnouts and the, the earnout number is a year old, so it might be different. You could buy, you could have the entire business free and clear of all debt for $150 million. And that seems still like a good price to me, considering that it's doing $30 million in ARR when it comes to Shopify yeah. apps. And they're doing more revenue when it comes to Shopify themes and the dev agency. Um, so it still seems like a good business to me. Uh, I was just surprised that their valuation had gotten hit so hard. Yeah. They, they're like a, a smart group of people for sure. They are. In fact, I, I, I would just imagine like it's, or I would even say it's like kind of undervalued. Yeah, me too. Uh, it seems like it's undervalued to me too. And to be clear, I own no shares. I have no non-public information about the business. Uh, I want to be really clear about that. Uh, but it does seem under, uh, undervalued to me as well. And, yeah. you know, I love going through, the, uh, like, I feel like, um, you know, we've talked a lot about smaller company valuations. I love going through these bigger company valuations because the numbers are so public. Like, you know, I don't feel bad. Like, you know, if we got a deck and it was like someone sent us a deck and it was confidential, I would feel, you know, I wouldn't feel comfortable going through it uh, right. on, uh, on our pod because, you know, it's confidential. This is publicly available information that anyone can go through. Um, and yeah, I feel like the business is undervalued as well. I'm shocked that it's trading. At a, it's a hundred less than $150 million business free and clear of debt. Uh, with this much revenue coming from Shopify apps. Totally. I guess the only question is, do you think Stamp... Like, what happens to Stamp.com? We're investors in Okendo, but I don't know if Stamp.com does well or does poorly over the next 10 years. Like, there seem to be so many review companies popping up. So I don't know what happens over the next decade when it comes to, you know, Stamp.com. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think it depends, like, the rate of people starting e-commerce businesses. Yeah, Um, that's a good point. You know, I think, like... um, I think there's, yeah, I think there's enough like new stores that come up uh, before before they start hurting. But um, I think they'll do fine. I think they'll keep growing. I mean, they have a good product. Yeah, they do. They do use their product to be clear as well. Uh, and they're yeah. like the customer service used to be amazing pre this acquisition by Tiny Capital. I think it's called, or I'm sorry, yeah. uh, WeCommerce. Um, like the customer service. I would email them and have a problem and it would be two in the morning and they would respond within five minutes. And then it'd be 4 p.m. and they'd respond in five minutes. And I'm like, do you guys ever not respond to customer service emails within five minutes? Is that like a KPI that you have? Because if so, that is the best KPI I've ever seen in my entire life. It was really (laughs) spectacular. I've heard the customer service is not nearly as good as post acquisition, but I think the product is still really good. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay. We, episode 11 is coming up next week. We're going to talk about a bunch of great stuff. One is, I'm really excited about this, the long weekend update. Uh, what yep. have you been doing with the brand? You, you know, there's some reformulation on the horizon. There's some fulfillment issues on the, like that you've, uh, found out, uh, that you've discovered. There's a collab coming up. I'm really excited to get an, uh, an update on an operating business that we're running or that you're running and, uh, you know, where you get to hear it from the horses now. Awesome. Um, and I, I'm not sure, do you think that there's value when we go through these publicly traded uh, 10Ks? I was thinking about going through Wish next week, but I'm not sure if this is valuable for anyone or just a fun exercise I think, for me. I, I think they're, they're, they're fun to me too. Okay. I think the, um, the interesting thing would be like, 
uh, you know, for example, if we both went through wish in detail, okay, great. and then we both came to the table with our insights, I love that. or like That's learnings a great out of it. Okay, great. Yeah. Let's do that for wish next week. Cool. You know, wish.com has been destroyed. It was like a 17 or $20 billion business. And now it's like, I a think they were the biggest business. spender on Facebook for yeah, a yeah. long time. Yeah. I think they were spending like a hundred million dollars a year. Um, yeah. It was just an absolute insane amount. And I remember I chatted with the Facebook guys and they were like, it took Amazon two months to integrate with their Facebook. Like we give special API access to guys who are spending a fortune. It took Amazon months to integrate with our special access API. It took Wish days to integrate with it because they were like, this is our bread and butter. Yeah, 100%. Uh, okay, great. That's a great idea. I'm excited to both go through Wish and talk about it next week. Awesome. We'll see you next week. Awesome. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next time to cut through the noise in CPG, retail, and e-commerce. And if you enjoyed this episode, then why not share it with a friend? And be sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss the next one. 